Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I'll worship your holy name. And on that day, my strength is failing, the end draws near, and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending, ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. your holy name. I'll worship your holy name. Hey, good morning. Good morning. And hey to y'all online. Glad to have everybody here and everybody there. Whatever may come, whatever lies before me. Great line in that song. Uh, and that's just to give us hope and encouragement this morning. And we kind of need that, right? We need some hope. And encouragement. So here's some good news. We're going to talk about death today. Awesome. Harriet Tubman died in uh, 1913, I think. Her last words were, swing low, sweet chariot. That's pretty cool. Bo Diddley was a great blues musician. His last words were, his last word was, wow. And then Raphael, the famous Italian artist, his last word was happy, except it was in Italian, not English. I would tell you what Jesus' last words were, but he hasn't spoken them yet, which is really good news. But this morning, we're going to look at Paul's last words in the book of 2 Timothy, the last letter he ever wrote. And, and it sounds dismal and dark and sad, and it's not. It's good. It's a really good goodbye. Hey, let's stand. We're going to worship together. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're there, and we're all in this together. Let's praise the Lord. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever.
He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Mine are days that God has numbered. I was made to walk with him. Yet I look for worldly treasure and forsake the King of kings. But mine is hope in my Redeemer. Though I fall, his love is sure. For Christ has paid for every failing. I am his forevermore. Mine are days and times of sorrow. Darkness not yet understood. Through the valley I must travel, where I see no earthly good. But mine is peace that flows from heaven, and the strength in times of need. I know my pain will not be wasted, Christ completes his work in me. Mine are days here as a stranger, pilgrim on a narrow way. One with Christ I will encounter, harm and hatred for his name. But mine is armor for this battle, strong enough to last the war. And he has said he will deliver safely to the golden shore. And mine are keys to Zion City, 
where beside the King I walk, for there my heart has found its treasure. Christ is mine forevermore. Come rejoice now, O oh my soul, for his love is my reward. Fear is gone and hope is sure. Christ is mine forevermore. Come rejoice now, O oh my soul, for his love is my reward. Fear is gone and hope is sure. Christ is mine forevermore. Come rejoice now, O oh my soul, for his love is my reward. Fear is gone and hope is sure. Christ is mine forevermore. And mine are keys to Zion City, where beside the King I walk. For there my heart has found its treasure. Christ is mine forevermore. Christ is mine forevermore. Amen. Be seated, please. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to be reading from Hebrews chapter 2. Um, where the author talks about Jesus being made fully human. I'm going to pick up in verse 14. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that his death might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he has made he is to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become merciful and faith, a faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he's, he is able to help those who are being tempted. We all have fears. Uh, some of us have fear of snakes, uh, fear of heights. For me, this past week, watching uh, Shark Fest on National Geographic, I have a renewed sense of uh, fear of bull sharks and great whites. Um, lately, we've had a lot to be fearful of. The last six months, we've been dealing with a worldwide pandemic. Uh, we've had fear and anxiety for our families, particularly those who are vulnerable to the virus, uh, fear because of what it's doing to our economy. For us to have children that are starting school, we've got a lot of fear and anxiety as they begin uh, to learn in environments very new and different than they're used to. But it's okay to have fear. But God doesn't want us to stay there. The author in Hebrews reminds us that Jesus was made fully human by God. He knows what it's like to be us, to feel fear, anxiety, grief and doubt and the good news is because of his death on a cross burial and resurrection we now have freedom from death we are no longer slaves to fear we are children of God we are his and he is ours we are his creation and we possess because of that a peace and a joy that surpasses all understanding let's pray Father, we just thank you for this time to get together, Lord. Uh, we ask that you would bless us, watch over us. Lord, take our, take our fear and our anxiety away, Lord. Give us that peace, that joy that surpasses our understanding. We ask that you bless this bread that represents your body. And we remember what you did for us, Lord. Thank you for your love, for your grace, your mercy. And we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen.
soon and very soon my king is coming robed in righteousness and crowned with love when i see him i shall be made like him soon and very soon soon and very soon i'll be going to the place he has prepared for me there my sin erased my shame forgotten soon and very soon i will be with the one i love with unveiled face i'll see him there my soul will be satisfied soon and very soon soon and very soon see the procession the angels and the elders round the throne at his feet i'll lay my crowns my worship soon and very soon i will be with the one i love with unveiled face i'll see him there my soul will be satisfied soon and very soon though i have not seen him my heart knows him well jesus christ the lamb the lord of heaven i will be with the one i love with unveiled face i'll see him there my soul will be satisfied soon and very soon soon offer thanks. God, time is irrelevant in your kingdom. Everything is passing. And yet we are made new in you and through you because of the sacrifice that you made on our behalf. And so we pray as we take the cup this morning that we would, that we would meet each day with renewed hope, with renewed freedom of fear, knowing that you are in control of all and regardless what may come, we live only to serve you and we accept whatever the future holds. Thank you for Jesus' blood shed for us on the cross. As we share it together today, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. When the night is falling and the day is done, I can hear you calling, come, I will come, while you sing over me. When the night surrounds me, all my dreams undone, I can hear you calling, come, I will come, while you sing over me. When the night would hide my way, 
I will listen until I hear you say. Let's stand. How I love you, child, I love you. How I love you, child, I love you. How I love you. How I love you, child, I love you. How I love you, child, I love you. How I love you. When this life is over and the race is run, I will hear you calling, come, I will come, while you sing over me. When the night would hide my way, I will listen until I hear you say, How I love you, child, I love you. How I love you, child, I love you. How I love you. How I love you, child, I love you. How I love you, child, I love you. How I love you. Hallelujah, 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 night is falling and the day is done I can hear you calling come I will come while you sing over me let's pray together Holy Father there is so much fear in our world today. And so many of your people are afraid. Some of us are afraid of the virus. Some of us are afraid of the financial implications, afraid of how we're going to manage school and work and kids and school and virtual learning. And some of us are afraid of the police. Some of us are afraid of racial tensions. We're afraid of politicians. God, would you send your spirit of courage, not your spirit, not a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of courage among your people so that we can face all of this with the knowledge that you are on your throne, that your son has defeated death, and that your spirit is filling your people. Can we... Can we just experience that this morning and throughout this week? Deliver us from this fear. Help us to be people of faith and courage. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you guys so much. Hey, before we get started real quick, I had a, uh, Steve uh, Krieger handed me a note right before service. Uh, it says, if you have not already taken our online questionnaire how are you doing at some point today when the sermon gets bored ring Krieger dude could you please take that well if the sermon gets boring and you haven't already taken pardon me go right now and take it yes uh, at some point if you could take that uh, online survey how are you doing it's an online questionnaire we just want to hear from you how, how things are going uh, and we've already had a whole bunch of you Respond, but if you haven't, shame on you. And B, do it. Uh, you, you, do it right now. It's fine. This is just the intro. You won't miss much. So, and it doesn't take long. Seriously, just do that online questionnaire. How, questionnaire. How are you doing? You should have gotten that in your email this morning when you uh, got the bulletin email. 
And if not, you can go online, twickenham.org, and it's there too. So turn in your Bibles or your device to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4. This is where we'll be this morning, 2 Timothy chapter 4. The last couple of weeks, we have been looking at some texts in the Old Testament. And this morning, we're skipping all the way to nearly the end of the Bible. And we are looking to the Bible uh, to help us deal with what's going on around us and within us these days because we have lost normal. Normal went on spring break back in March and it hasn't come back yet. Um, when, when we go out, we're getting accustomed and adjusted to seeing and wearing masks everywhere we go. We are adjusting to standing feet away from other people. We are doing work and school and church through a screen, many of us. Um, we're, we're checking the news every morning to find out about the latest infection rates and death counts. And by the way, infection rates in Madison County on an average basis are way, way down. Good job, Madison County. Keep wearing your masks. Keep washing your hands. Speaking of which, our hands are raw from washing them all the time. I've washed my hands more in the last six months than I think I have my entire life. And, and, and our hearts are a little worn out too from all this, right? We're wondering when, when it's going to end. And, and while it feels like the pandemic has taken up permanent residence, in other ways it feels like our country is coming apart at the seams. And I don't even want to think about what it's going to be like as we get closer to November around election time. Can I just ask you, in view of that, to lay off anti-social media and don't, don't get caught up in all that? Why don't we pray for our leaders instead of complain about them more? Why don't we talk to God about them instead of railing to each other about it? Because that's going to separate us, and we don't need anything else that's going to separate us. But I see all of that coming, and I see the pandemic, and I see what's going on with racial relations, and I just... My heart gets heavy from all of that. Does your heart feel heavy from all of that? And so that's why we keep coming back to the Bible to help us deal with all of this. Now, if, if you're new to this whole Bible business, if you're here this morning and this is, you're kind of not, you're kicking the tires on it maybe, or you're here because somebody asked you to come and you're not sure you believe all this, or if you're, if you're listening online, or hey, thank you for, for tuning in, but if you're new to all this Bible business, you may be wondering why we think an ancient document has anything to say about a novel pandemic and the cultural convulsions that we see on the news every single minute of every single day. It's a fair question, because this is really, this is a really old book, but we believe it's more than just an old book. We, we believe these are the words of God to us. We believe there is a God, we believe he has spoken, and we believe that these are his words. And we believe that they are eternally relevant and reliable and true. And even if you're not there, there are a couple of things you just have to admit about the Bible. Once you, once you begin to get to know it, there are a couple of things that you, you just have to admit. And one of those is that the stories in Scripture are astonishingly relevant. Last week, we were in Exodus. Exodus, that's about as old as it gets, right? I mean, that's at least 4,000-year-old history. And we looked at the story of Moses, and here's what that story uh, includes. It, it, it includes um, stuff about privilege, oppression, slavery, abortion, and systemic racism. Really? Exodus? That's the stuff we're talking about now. That's the stuff the Bible was talking about thousands of years ago. The week before that, we, were, we, we learned about David hiding out in a cave. There were all kind, of political, all kind of political evil going on around David. And we learned that David had to learn how to wait for God to change his circumstances. You ever get tired of waiting? That's so current. And both of these characters, and the one we're going to look at this morning, dealt with the same kind of isolation we're having to deal with right now. The Bible is incredibly current. And then the second thing you've got to admit about Scripture is that the possibilities described in the Bible 
are enormously appealing. Even if you don't believe that there is a God who loves us even in our awfulness and came to earth to rescue us and wants to welcome us into eternal bliss, don't you want that to be true? Larry Taunton is a a Christian author who lives in Birmingham, Alabama. And he developed an unlikely friendship with a gentleman named Christopher Hitchens. Hitchens was uh, uh, the late Christopher Hitchens. He was one of the most intelligent uh, and vocal atheists in the world. Hitchens was diagnosed with cancer, and he went and stayed at, at Taunton's Birmingham home for a little while. And during that time, he and, and, and Christopher Hitchens and Taunton took some long road trips together. And on one of, those, one of those trips, Taunton was driving through the Shenandoah Valley, and Christopher Hitchens was reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 11. And uh, that's the story where Jesus raises his friend Lazarus from the dead. And in the story, Martha, the sister of Lazarus, says to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And so Hitchens, the atheist, is reading this, and he gets down to verses 25 and 26, where Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this, Jesus said to Martha. So Hitchens took off his reading glasses and he looked at Taunton and he asked in good King James English, dost thou believest this, Larry Taunton? And Taunton said, I do, but you knew that before you asked. The question is, dost thou believest this, Christopher Hitchens? And Hitchens paused for a moment like he was trying to come up with some clever response And then Taunton writes, with unexpected transparency, Christopher Hitchens, the atheist, said, I will admit that it is not without appeal to a man who is dying. What if it's true? What if it's true that the Bible points us to the answer to the universal, unavoidable, inevitable, inescapable problem that everybody's afraid of these days, death. That's why we're looking in 2 Timothy chapter 4. We talked about David in his cave. We talked about Moses in his wilderness. In a couple of weeks, we'll talk about John on his island. In a week after that, Jesus in his desert. But this morning, we're going to talk about Paul in his prison. 2 Timothy is probably the last letter Paul wrote. It contains his final recorded words shortly after he dictated or wrote the last sentence in this letter he was executed by order of Nero so I want to want to hear his words but before we do I need to set the scene for you give you a little bit of information about what was going on around the time Paul uttered these last words so on July 18th in the year 64 a fire broke out in the city of Rome near the Circus Maximus That's where they held the chariot races. The fire raged for almost a week, and it burned burned much of the city. And even though Nero was out of town at the time of the fire, the rumor spread that he had been responsible for the fire, that he had had somebody start that fire so that he could rebuild the city after his liking. And this, this, this rumor just persisted, and so Nero got a little tired of it. A Roman historian named Tacitus tells us what happened next. He writes, therefore, to scotch the rumor, Nero substituted as culprits and punished with the utmost refinements of cruelty a class of men loathed for their vices whom the crowd styled Christians. Christus, from whom they got their name, had been executed by sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate when Tiberius was emperor, and the pernicious superstition, that's what they call Christianity, the pernicious superstition, was checked for a short time, only to break out afresh, not only in Judea, the home of the plague, but in Rome itself, where all the horrible and shameful things of the world collect and find a home. 
Most historians believe that Paul was in prison during this persecution as one of the leaders of that pernicious superstition. Now, if you're a student of the Bible, you may be thinking, well, wait a minute. Now, in the end of Acts, Luke said that Paul was imprisoned in Rome uh, under house arrest because of some accusations the Jews made against him, not because of the Roman persecution. This is not that imprisonment. We think Paul uh, spent two years under house arrest and then he got to travel some more before coming back to Rome and being arrested. This time, he's not under house arrest. Early tradition suggests that Paul was imprisoned for the last time in Rome's Mamertine prison, Rome's death row. The house arrest that Luke describes at the end of Acts was inconvenient. Imprisonment in Mamertine was inhumane. It was a dungeon. Prisoners were lowered into the dungeon through a hole. It was cold, it was dark, and it was wet. Many prisoners committed suicide there. Others died of starvation. In his final letter to his young protege, Timothy, Paul hints at the conditions he was living under at the time in Mamertine. In chapter 2, verse 9, he writes, I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. In chapter 4, verse 9, he says, do your best to come to me quickly. He knew his time was short. Chapter 4, verse 13, he says, when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas. He's cold, and it's going to get colder because in 420, he says, do your best to get here before winter. Not only is he enduring these inhumane conditions, but he feels abandoned by people, people who should have been there for him because several times in this short four-chapter letter, he talks about being deserted by various people. And those who haven't deserted him are fulfilling their ministry responsibilities in other cities. And so Paul feels terribly isolated. Here's the thing. Even though he's enduring inhumane conditions in the Mamertine prison, even though he feels abandoned, even though he knows his time is short and that he is going to face the executioner's sword in, in, in just a matter of weeks or months, there is not a hint of fear in this letter. Paul is absolutely fearless. How was he able, given all of that, to remain full of courage? How, how could the last goodbye be that good? See, we need to know these things. Because some of us have loved ones that are facing death. Some of us are facing it. The truth is, the death rate for human beings is 100%. At some point, we are all going to have to say goodbye. How do you do that with courage? Okay, so Paul is going to tell us, and I'm going to tell you three things, and they, they show up in three verses in chapter 4, verses 6, 7, and 8. Listen to this. He writes, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. First thing that made Paul able to face all of that with courage, the first thing that made his goodbye good is that the most important thing in Paul's life was not his life. The most important thing in his life was not his life. He uses the, uh, the, the imagery of a drink offering there in verse 6. I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. I'm being poured out as a sacrifice. Uh, he, he uses that same uh, imagery in another letter too. In Philippians chapter 2 verse 17, he said, but even if I am being poured out like a drink offering, because at that point in Philippians, he didn't know whether he was going to survive prison or not. He was in a different prison at that time, and, and he did survive it. But at the time, he didn't. Incidentally, do you notice the difference between those two statements, the one in Timothy and the one in Philippians? In, in Philippians, he said, if, he qualified it, if I'm being poured out, because he didn't know whether he was going to live or die. In Timothy, he doesn't say if. He says, I am being poured out. Now he knows. The thing I want you to see, though, is that there's something more important to Paul 
than clinging to his life. And he hints at it in verse 7. He says, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I've kept the faith. Those are athletic metaphors. The good fight refers to uh, Olympic wrestling or boxing that Paul and all people in that era would have known about. Uh, finishing the race is a reference to the marathon event of the, uh, the marathon event, the running the, 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 the race. And, and it, those are not the first time, Paul would have loved ESPN, but those are not the first times he's used those metaphors. In Acts chapter 20, when he's saying goodbye to a group of people whom he loved very much, the, the leaders of the church in Ephesus, he said this in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, I consider my life worth nothing to me. Paul's life was not the most important thing to him. The most important thing was not his life. I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. Here it is, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. The most important thing in Paul's life was not his life. It was that his life be used to, to tell people about what God had done in Jesus. Listen to me. If comfort, if health, if prosperity, if longevity are the most important things to you, then when your life gets inconvenient, and it will, when your health is wrecked, and it will be, when your prosperity gets plundered, and it always is, when your time gets short, and everybody's time gets short, if those are the most important things to you, you're going to be devastated. But if living faithfully, if fulfilling God's purposes, if finishing well are your priorities, your goodbye will be good. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 10, verse 39, and I love how the New Living Translation puts it, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. The most important thing in Paul's life was not his life. It was the mission. Second, Paul knew that his future was not based on his performance. Paul was able to face his death with courage. He was able to have a good goodbye because he knew that his future was not based on his performance. That's verse 8 in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Okay, so wait a minute. You just said that Paul's future was not based on his performance, but he just got through telling us that he'd fought a good fight, that he'd finished the race, that he'd kept the faith. So it, <clears throat> it sounds like Paul is saying, based on my heroic life of faith, God is going to reward me with the victor's crown. So let's look a little more closely. Back in chapter 1 of this same letter, Paul tells Timothy, God has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. First, I want you to notice what verse 9 does not say. It does not say, we lived a holy life and then God saved us. It says, he saved us and called us to a holy life. And the difference between those two sentences is cosmic. You see, a lot of people, and you may be one of them, a lot of people think that you got to get your life all squared away and fixed up and straightened out and buttoned down, and then God will save you. That's exactly wrong. And that's an extremely dangerous way to think. It's dangerous because we are really, really good at messing up our lives. We're experts at it. It's the, it's the thing we do best. And it's just possible that, that we could get so tangled up in ourselves and in our sin that we begin to think, I'm so deep in debt, I've strayed so far from the path, I'm so broken beyond repair that I can never be good enough for God, and so I'll just quit trying. I'll quit trying to connect with God. I'll quit all of it. I want you to repeat something. You here and you there at home, I want you to repeat four words. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Five words. You ready? Here are the words. No one is good enough. Say it. 
No one is good enough. Did you say it at home? I know you're sitting there and you're like, I'm not going to say that because we're all sitting around here together. Say it again. No one is good enough. That's why Jesus lived and died and lived again. He did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Look at the last part of verse 9. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his purpose and his grace. Paul was unafraid of death. Paul's goodbye was good because he knew his future wasn't based on his performance. It was based on the grace of God. Now, I'd be a really bad minister if I didn't back up and point out the part where it says he has called us to a holy life. He saves us from our addictions and our adulteries. He saves us from our racism and our hatred. He saves us from our selfishness and our sin, and he calls us to live differently. In chapter 2, Paul will say, we must turn away from wickedness. We must flee the evil desires of youth. We must pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Listen to me. You cannot earn a right relationship with God by how you live, but you can lose it by how you live. You cannot earn a right relationship with God by how you live, but by how you live, you can lose it. So we're saved by his grace and we're called to live differently. A couple more things here as we think about this this point, and we're talking about the fact that, that Paul could face the future, even though it was a short one on this side of eternity, without fear because he knew his future wasn't based on his performance. Back in verse chapter 4, verse 8, 2 Timothy, Paul says, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. See that word award? The Greek word that it comes from means to relinquish what is one's own. To relinquish what is one's own. Paul is saying the Lord will relinquish what is his and give it to me. He will give me righteousness. I can't earn it. I can't earn right standing before God. So what what I receive from him is a gift, not a payment. And then there's this. He says, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. The gift of being right with God isn't just for a hero like Paul. It's for you. It's for me. It's for anybody who wants it. Paul's goodbye was good because he knew that the future wasn't based on, his future wasn't based on his performance and neither is yours. One more thing. Paul wasn't afraid to die because he knew that death was not the end. Wasn't wasn't the last page of the last chapter of his life. He says, In verse 6, I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is at hand. That word departure, it was used in two ways back in Paul's day. If you live near the sea, that's the word you'd use when you untied the ropes that held a ship to the dock. If you lived inland, it's the word you would use when it was time to fold up a tent and break camp. Neither of those things are about the end of something. They are both about the beginning of something, the beginning of a voyage or the continuation of a journey. And that echoes something you heard a few minutes ago. Psalm 23, verse 4. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, or though I walk through the darkest valley, we walk through it, not to it. Death is not the dock where you anchor your ship. It is not the valley where you pitch your tent. Paul could face the end because he knew it wasn't the end. Why don't you guys come on back up, Lincoln? If you don't believe that, you don't believe any of what we've talked about this morning. Can I just ask you this question? 
isn't there some part of you that wants that to be true? There are a number of, of us here at Twickenham who would love to sit down with you and hear your questions and doubts and tell you why we believe it is true. And if you do believe it, then you have nothing to fear. Thomas Brooks was a, an English Puritan preacher in the 1600s. He wrote, death is another Moses. It delivers believers out of bondage and from making bricks in Egypt. Don't be afraid. There is a God who loves us, even in our awfulness, who came to earth to rescue us and wants to welcome us in eternal bliss. He is not going to leave us in Egypt making bricks. We get to go home. That's what death does for us. Let's stand. Let's sing. There's a stirring deep within me. Could it be my time has come when I see my gracious Savior face to face when all is done? Is that his voice I am hearing? Come away, my precious one. Is he calling me? Is he calling me? I will rise up, rise up, then bow down and lay my crown at his wounded feet. There's a stirring deep within me. Could it be my time has come when I see my gracious Savior face to face when all is done? Is that his voice I am hearing? Come away, my precious one. Is he calling me? Is he calling I will rise up, rise up, and bow down, and lay my crown at his wounded feet. I will rise up, rise up. church said hey Jody thanks people always ask me why I didn't want to be a preacher and I always said because I don't have that much to say and Sunday is always coming and you got to have now don't misunderstand me there's a lot of guys who preach that still don't have something to say but Jody you've always got something to say it was fantastic thank you for that um, junior high and senior high parents, you have a parent meeting in two weeks on the Sunday in the fellowship hall downstairs where you can social distance and be safe while our youth ministry team goes over their plans for the coming uh, fall semester. So make plans for that in two weeks. And that is all of the announcements that I have. So thank you for being here and hopefully we'll see you again next week. And may the amazing grace of Jesus bless you and this morning after these words and these songs give you peace thanks have a great week